uh, we're beginning a series today, a two-week series called Money Questions. And uh, today I'll be answering nine questions that our staff people, we have about 40 people on staff here at the church, and I meet with them every couple weeks. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I met with them and said, write down your real questions about money and giving to God. Write down your real questions. And so they did that, and we had 40 to 50 questions. I'm going to answer nine of those this morning. Next week, Tim Butker, who's teaching down the hall today, he's going to come, and his teaching about money questions and more about all the money that you have, 100%. So today, I took more of the questions that are about um, giving, to the church, and so I'm going to teach. If you're a guest or a visitor, too, we're glad you're here, because uh, we think Jesus taught a whole bunch about money. Far more, Jesus taught far more about money than we do. We teach about money two or three Sundays a year, and uh, Jesus taught almost up to 25% of what he said had to do with resources and finances. And so uh, we don't teach about money that much, but we're glad you're here. Um, Let me begin this way. What if you were born... Uh, as a guest in Disneyland. I mean, what if your birth took place at Disneyland and you spent your whole life at Disneyland and you died at Disneyland? I mean, let's think about that. What, what would that be if you're in those gates there? Um, what would it be, uh, Disneyland's uh, exist to produce the happiest guests on earth? And uh, people come in every day, hundreds of staff people in Disneyland to make the guest's life easy and comfortable and fun. And uh, what would it be like? Just think about that a minute. You were born in Disneyland. You lived your whole life in Disneyland. You died in Disneyland. You never got outside of Disneyland. Rich Stearns, in his book, he's the president, uh, CEO of World Vision, says this. He says, uh, if you've been born in America, in a very real sense, you've been born in Disneyland. That, um, that the 300 million people who live in the United States, uh, compared to the rest of the world, are incredibly rich. Even our poorest folks are rich. Um, There are 75% of the world's population today who live on $10 a week or less. Let me say that again. 75% of all the 7 billion who live in the world live on $10 a week or less. And you know, we have high school kids who have jobs that make a lot more than that. And so um, that's the context in which now I want you to be thinking as I share the answers to some of these questions that came from our staff, that in a very real way, we live in Disneyland and uh, uh, our our lives and our problems and our financial challenges are so different than in the rest of the world. We don't worry, even our poorest folks, about can I get a clean glass of water today? We don't worry really, can I uh, find an aspirin? I mean, we we just are, uh, we're we're in Disneyland. So, number one, here's the first question that our staff asked me, and and it's an interesting question, and it's, how much exactly should I give? How much should I give to the church? It's like, I can't decide how much to give. Part of me wants to give a large, reckless number of dollars. Another part knows that um, I need some money for expenses and for my family, and I need to be careful. So how much should I give? And there's a tension. After being a Christ follower for 50 years, I've come to understand that there's always going to be a tension around how much money do I give back to God? And the tension comes out of really two themes. The first theme is there's a biblical theme I would call prudence. Verses in the Bible that speak to working hard, saving money, preparing for the future, providing for my family. I would call that prudence. That all of us should have this theme of prudence. Hey, I'm going to be careful. God gave me this money. I need to steward it. I need to raise my family. I need to provide for my future. I need to buy insurance. I need to be ready. That's prudence. Then there's this other theme in the Bible that we find. And I would call it a, um, a, a theme of carefree giving. Don't store up on earth treasures where Marth and Rust will destroy. Don't worry about food or clothing. Give generously to the needy and the work of God. Why worry when you cannot even add a single moment to your life? So on the one hand, we have prudence. On the other hand, we have the Bible talking about carefree giving. So that doesn't really answer your question about how much you should give. It just means if you struggle with this, it's probably okay. What's prudent? What's carefree? Um, faith-filled giving. So then there's a verse in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 that says this, whoever sows sparingly 
will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So I think when you decide on the amount to give, I think you could ask four questions. The first question would be, is this generous? Do I in my heart feel like this is a generous gift? Or is it a sparing, grudging gift? The second question you might ask is, is this from my heart? Is this like what I want to do deep in my spirit? Is this from my heart? The second, third question you might want to ask is, is this under compulsion or manipulation? And I giving this because somebody is pushing me to do it. We're not to do it under compulsion. And the fourth one is, can I give this cheerfully? Hey, can I just give it cheerfully? So if you've decided on an amount to give to the work of God, you could ask these questions. Is it generous? Is it from the heart? Is it not under compulsion or by manipulation? Can I give it cheerfully? And now we just say one more thing. Uh, uh, it honors God when we have a plan for our giving. Not when we walk in here and say, well, what's in my billfold? What's in my checkbook? But it honors God when we have a plan. In the Old Testament, there's thing, this thing about first fruits. It's like we want to give from the beginning. We want to give from the first fruits. We want to decide in advance, this is what we're going to give to God. And uh, giving to God helps us in ways we'll never understand. It breaks the grip of greed in our lives. It breaks the grip of fear in our lives. And it resources God work, God's work and brings his kingdom. It blesses us. Okay. Now, number two, question. Well, what about tithing? Should 10% go to the church? How about that? the other great organizations around? Okay, so let's, let's dive into this quick. Um, tithing is the biblical principle affirmed by Jesus in the New Testament, Matthew 23, 23, that says you and I should give 10% of our income to God as a, as a beginning point, as a, as a kind of a target, as a place to begin. And it's one way to establish God's reign and his authority and his leadership in our lives. I would even go so far as to say it's impossible to grow spiritually if I don't include God in my giving. You can't grow spiritually. And I think a lot of people get stuck spiritually and they go, why am I not growing? Why am I not feeling the presence of God? Well, one of the parts of that is giving. Because that's where trust and God's authority in my life comes. The question is, should all of this go to the church or can it go to other great organizations? Now, couple things. Um, it's not apples to apples. I mean, uh, some of us write checks to libraries or secular, in, in, uh, secular universities or Boy Scouts or even political campaigns. And that's generous. And there's good things. There's good reasons to write checks to those places. But that's different than what God's talking about in his word of to uh, expand his kingdom. And so it's not apples to apples. So within God's kingdom, God's work, Many of us at Orchard practice what's called storehouse giving. Storehouse giving is an Old Testament principle where they were instructed to give a 10% tithe to the storehouse from which um, many people were fed. And so one of, lots of churches teach storehouse giving, which is 10% of our giving should go to the local church because that's where we're fed. That's where we receive spiritual feeding. And so this is where it feeds my kids. This is where it feeds my family spiritually. This is where it feeds me. So we're going to 10% to the church and then offerings beyond that to other organizations. Now, I don't really see this supported again. Uh, it's an Old Testament principle. I don't see necessarily support for that in the New Testament. So what I've tended to say is that um, there should be a good part of your giving that goes to the local church. Um, it, it's a, a place for your 10%. Um, uh, because I don't see affirmation for that, uh, I would just say uh, you got to decide, although lots of us do practice that. Uh, but remember, we're not talking about the law of God. We're talking about the heart of God. That this is more about your heart than the law. In our reveal survey that we took four years ago, 561 people at Orchard um, took this survey and 30% of us who took the survey said that we give 10% or more to the church, to, to God's work, to God's work. And so uh, we, you can see we still have lots of work to do in helping people grow in this regard. Number three question, is there such a thing as back tithes, like back taxes? I thought that was an interesting question. The answer is no. It's called God's grace. It's like at the cross, I don't owe God for what I didn't know in my past. And um, when Jesus went to the cross and he died for sin, shame, and brokenness, 
He died for our yesterdays. So there is no like back tithes, like back taxes, like, gosh, I'm in the hole to God for so much money or something like that. No, he's not going to come like a tax collector after you. What if I give more and my spouse, what if I want to give more and my spouse, husband or wife, wants to give less? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Now, this is not something Lynn and I have struggled about. We have financial struggles, Lynn and I. I think she's in the room here. We have some financial struggles, and um, one of them is in tipping. Uh, we go to a restaurant, and like we cannot agree on how much that tip should be, and every single time, no matter what I write on it, she says, well, do you think that's enough? I mean, it doesn't matter what I put on there. Um, another place is like gift giving. Financially, we struggle with gift giving. I feel like Lynn grew up in a family where you give gifts to your second cousins, your fourth uncles, you're like, it's like I grew up in a family where we don't even give my brothers gifts. I never did. And then the amount of money for gifts. So, okay, that's us. Now, we have not, I see a lot of you shaking your heads though. I got to tell you, I, I touched something here. Uh, now, this idea of giving to the church and husbands and wives agreeing on this thing. Uh, uh, one time a church leader came to me and said, I give in cash in an unmarked envelope because if my husband knew how much I gave, there would be trouble. That's a problem, right? It's not good to be deceptive in a marriage and give more than like your spouse wants to give. So how do you get over this question? Well, one is um, you... Uh, you, uh, you, t- you talk to each other. You pray together. You ask each other, what's the right amount of us forgive? Remember prudence and like um, carefree giving? Well, sometimes God puts a prudent person whose foot is on the brake married to a carefree person whose foot is on the gas pedal. And so you got both of those going at the same time and then you got to like find your way through that. So if that's you, the number one thing we want to say is oneness in a marriage is most important. Ephesians 5.21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So you got to put each other first in line. So you got to listen to each other. You got to pray together. You got to come, come up together with what's the right amount of giving. I have uh, breakfast with one of our leaders the other day, and I was telling him what I was teaching. And he said, yeah, my wife has really helped me understand that she needs to know how much we're giving and what we're giving to because then she gets to participate in the giving and the joy of the thing. So I would encourage you, uh, do it together, pray, uh, think about it, uh, and have a plan together and live out the plan. Number five, what if I don't feel joyful about giving? Great question. What if you go to give and you go, I feel more like bad. I feel more scared. I don't feel joy. What about that? Well, there's a verse, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act. So to will means to have the desire. In other words, I want to do this. So we can pray and ask God to help us have joy in giving and then help us give. We can pray for both of those things. I would also say if you list your blessings... If you list your blessings, uh, you're, you're feeling kind of uh, like you don't want to give, simply call a time out and start listing your blessings from your life. And it will help you see who God is, and it will help you see all the gifts he's given to you. And then you'll give out of more joy, I believe. Um, sometimes there are lies in our heads put there, even when we were little. If I give, there won't be enough left. That's a lie. It won't matter, really, if I sacrifice or give. The world's so big, the needs are so great, it won't matter. That's a lie. I don't have enough to give. Um, My first trip to Haiti, uh, I was sitting there, and the night before Saturday night, I asked the pastor what he wanted me to teach in his church. He said, Dave, I want you to teach on stewardship, giving faithfully to God. And I climbed in my bunk that night, and I thought, oh, my goodness. Do I know anything about giving that I would say to parents of kids of parents who have children they can barely feed. What do I know about giving? When we went into the Haiti home of a kid we support and they had one chair and two pans and that was their earthly belongings. What do I know about giving? And then it occurred to me as I thought about God's word, it's true. The principles we teach in true are, pr- are true no matter what resource level you're at. No matter what resource level you're at, these principles that are God's principles are true. So I could stand up and really teach. Now, they weren't born in Disneyland like we were. 
but I could teach that God's principles are true, and they give a little, just like we give a little. So uh, that, uh, that helped me. Now, um, can volunteering in the church, giving time, take the place of giving my money? I'm a little tight on money. Can I just volunteer a few extra hours? That's a great question. Um, I was visiting with one of our church leaders, and he said this. Is rolling in the mud the same as taking a shower? What? What's that got to do with this? And he said, well, it's like water. It's like little kids, a five-year-old could have fun with water rolling in the mud. He could have fun with water taking a shower. Rolling in the mud, taking a shower, same water. It's giving, but it, we need to give in all three categories is what he was trying to say. We need to give time, talents, and money. We can't just say, I'm going to give time and talents, but not money. We can't just say, I'm going to give money, but not time and talents. We need to give in all three areas. Uh, Jesus wants to be Lord, leader of every area of our lives. And if we think we can like block out money and say, well, you can be Lord, leader, everything except my money. It's just a bad plan, bad plan. Uh, I'm in too much debt. Do I pay off the debt before I give? Debt is an anchor that's strangling many of our folks in North America. Many of us have too much credit card debt, too much auto debt, too much debt. Um, And uh, we're anchored to that. And the answer here, which I would give, is that uh, we need to both fight back our debt and we need to fight, fight for our giving. We need to do both. Debt must be fought back like a plague, And we must have a strategy for decreasing our debt uh, so that we have more freedom, less of an anchor. And so many people tell me, Dave, I'd like to go on a mission trip with you guys, but I have too much debt. I can't do it. Well, let's let's have a plan to get out of debt and have a plan uh, to uh, increasingly give uh, money toward God's work. Are my blessings, number eight, are my blessings related to how much I give? Interesting question. It's a question I hesitate in a short, brief answer to give an answer to. I would say uh, briefly, yes. I would say it because of Luke 6, 38. Given it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So God's saying, if you want to give back to me in a little cup, that's okay. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to heap it up. I'm going to overflow it. I'm going to hand it back to you. If you want to give to me in a big cup, I'm going to heap it, bless it, give it back to you. You want to give me a dump truck of giving? Yeah, that's fine. Now, this is not the prosperity gospel you might hear on TV where you give money to God to get rich. Uh, This is not that. This is like um, you give and it's impossible to outgive God. In fact, I would even say he's given more to you already than you'll ever give him. What he did on the cross, you have an eternal home in heaven. You have a presence of Jesus' spirit with you every day, the rest of your life, into eternity. He's already given you more blessings than you could ever pay him back for. But there's also this other part of, if I live faithful, if I live um, giving, then he's going to continue, continue to bless me. Not dollar for dollar. As many of us, what we, our needs, our primary needs are not money. So we give money to his kingdom. We give time and talents to his kingdom. And he blesses us in other ways. Ways that are more needed by us. Um, Simple faith. Being a follower of Christ. Eric Lins is a member of our church. And a couple weeks ago, he wrote me an email. And he told me a story. And when I knew I was going to teach this, I said, Eric, would you put that on video? And so he came in this week. He put it on video. I'd like you to listen to Eric's story here. Last December, Dave uh, did a teaching on giving, and uh, really what I took home from that was uh, he was talking about giving an uncomfortable amount, and uh, you know he had talked about tithing, and uh, but the thing that really hit me hard was the the end of the year gift, and we had never done that, just uh, in a sense, kind of a, a joy offering of uh, you know he's blessed us and he's provided for us, and um, you know just giving above and beyond you know what's required of us, and. So I left challenged and, you know, we prayed about it, um, my wife and I, and kind of came up with a number that we thought, okay, yeah, we'll give this much. And, and it really was more of a comfortable amount than uncomfortable amount. And so we were set on that. And 
at the same time, we were saving up for a treadmill. So we'd have to run outside in the winter and the, and the cold and everything like that. And we had saved up for one and we were excited about that. And one morning when we were praying, I just felt God's prompting. And he just said, you know, I want you to give the money you saved up for that treadmill. And I was like, oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, I mean, that was just kind of, and, and I was like, well, maybe that wasn't God, you know. But then, you know, as we, we prayed about it together, I uh, just realized, you know, that's kind of what we just felt him calling us to. And and it wasn't like a, you need to do this. It was just like, you know, you could buy that treadmill. That'd be all right, you know. Or you could, you know, invest that money in the kingdom of God and watch how uh, I use that that money to bless other lives and to bring people to the kingdom of God and use every dollar of that um, in a greater way than you could even ask or imagine, more so than anything you would ever purchase. And I was like, all right, you know, let's do this. And throughout the winter, running in the cold, you know, like there were some days it wasn't too bad and there were some days it was really junky outside. It was icy and it was below zero or whatever. And those days, you know, it just continued to feel that offering of just, you know, God, we just, we thank you for how you provided. We thank you. And it just continued to remind us of that provision, um, you know, as we ran outside in the wintertime. And what followed in the, the coming months there was not what we expected. Uh, it was really actually a financially difficult time. Uh, there was a number of medical bills that began to stack up and stack up and things happened and uh, then another big medical bill and another one and it was just pretty soon we found ourselves just feeling like we were drowning in, in medical debt. Um, in the middle of the summer we decided to uh, keep a, a notebook of the blessings that God had been bringing into our lives and because we just kind of had felt our hearts maybe uh, in a sense just kind of getting uh, bitter a little bit or just like oh what's going on you know and um, and so we just wrote down every little thing and it was so amazing to see how from little things to big things from wants to needs like how he just continued to provide and provide and provide and bless our family um, and it really put our hearts in a, in a, in a joyful place uh, even in the midst of a, a financially difficult time and, and so it's just been cool to see over the course of this year, you know, that time of just where it seemed like nothing was going our way to where, you know, he's, he's providing, you know, resources to be able to tackle that and, uh, and, and provide for our family. You know, it's easy to give and to tithe when things are good, um, but it's, it's really tough to tithe and to give and be faithful in that when things are tight. Um, and one thing that has been unchanging is the first fruits of our checks and everything is goes to the Lord before we pay anything out of it is very important to to give to the Lord out of joy that he's provided for our family and whether it be in, in, in time of, of uh, need or in time of plenty uh, the one thing that is unchanging is his faithfulness so uh, nine questions from our staff I thought I would put in the last question here and I think we have a slide for this the last question Dave what else would you like to say to us I'm glad you asked. Uh, I would like to say two things. One is I would like to say let's be a church that are uh, all about giving back to God but not judging each other. When I drive my 202, well, we, we have two cars, a 97 minivan and a 202 Grand Am that's kind of beat up. So when I drive my 202 Grand Am, park it in the parking lot, and when you drive in, let's say you have an older or a newer car, or maybe even a brand new car, you park it beside me, let's be a church where we don't judge each other. Uh, Jesus was real clear, judge not, lest you be judged. Let's be a church that doesn't judge. If you go and buy this new thing, whatever it is, let me not judge you. So if you are one who easily judges others and says, well, they should have given instead of bought in that second new car, they should have given instead of that, no judging. Now, if you're one who feels judged sometimes, then let's be clear about one thing. You live your life for an audience of one. One. It's Jesus. So my prayer is not only that we be an incredibly generous church, but that we be marked as a church that doesn't judge each other and doesn't feel judged at all, at all. And then uh, the last thing I would say is have a plan. Honor God by having a plan, by having a plan for your giving. It actually really matters to him. It's not so much he needs your money. I actually don't think he does. He wants your heart. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Thank you so much for listening. We're going to close with a couple worship songs like we always do, but I always look at the sheet and say, What's, what worship song did they put after my teaching? And like, I was amazed. 
uh, come on out, band. Uh, it was, um, be thou my vision. And it's totally what I'm trying to say. Keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on God. If he's our vision, that'll put giving in perspective. And then it also ends with the teaching, forever reign. And uh, we just want Christ to reign as leader and savior, rescuer of our lives.